Good morning. This is my backup talk that's uh, loaded up as a video in case my Skype talk doesn't work. So I'll, uh, as noted, I'm a mathematician. I'm housed in the Department of Mathematical Sciences, and I'll be looking at body weight responses to exercise from a quantitative point of view. Before I begin that, though, I want to give you a pitch why it's wonderful to team up with a mathematician, why they're important, and what we can do if we work together appropriately in an interdisciplinary team. From that, I'll give you a flavor of the kind of modeling that I do with, in regards to energy balance um, and take you through a diet-induced energy balance model that's been fully fleshed out. Modeling exercise is very interesting and there are some deviations from the diet-induced energy balance models and uh, I'd like to go over those with you and that's where the real intrigue settles in and I probably won't get to this <clears throat> but at some point I'd like to um, I've been exploring what happens after exercise is done what happens to a yo-yo exerciser if there's these profound changes that we know we can uh, determine quantitatively, does it uh, appear that um, after exercise stops that these changes go back to where they were or do they lead to somewhere else? And that's uh, the really interesting part of the puzzle, which uh, unfortunately I might not have time to cover. <clears throat> so why mathematical models? Um, why I came into the field in around 2010 to address the problem of dietary adherence. It's been talked about in the last couple of years quite a bit in, in the um, literature and also the media um, about the difficult of determining self-reported dietary intake. And uh, there was a number of papers that came out after the advent of doubly labeled water um, in, used by Dale Schuller for the first time in the late 1970s um, about the discrepancy between self-reported and actual intake and um, this is just one of the different uh, articles that have been written, but it's well documented that self-reported intake is often vastly underreported. And um, this makes it difficult to monitor adherence to dietary recommendations during a intervention because of um, there's no objective way to go in um, easily and determine intake. Now, of course, you could use doubly labeled water and body composition, but that that's places a heavy burden on the subjects and it's expensive. <clears throat> so I teamed up with Corby Martin from the Pennington Biomedical Research Center and um, we developed a mathematical model that we tested and validated to determine how much weight should someone lose on a, cha uh, on a change in intake that's been personalized. We built patient counseling software um, that also has a uh, counseling dashboard attached to it. But basically the idea is the individual would enter their personal in, um, personalized data in the top and the result would be a weight loss trajectory that's based on those individual inputs and this green shaded area around the the uh, blue curve of the trajectory, which we refer to as a zone, but you can think of it as something like a confidence interval. And inside that confidence interval, the patient would be deemed adherent. And um, there's a spreadsheet over here. You can actually input the actual weights and see it overlay. And of course, if they're in the green area, they're deemed adherent. So it's an ongoing process during the, in, um, during the intervention, and it can be used to modify behavior. <clears throat> the zone area was determined when we took the model and tested and validated the model against individuals where we had objective information about their intake. So these were the kind of error bounds that we came up with after uh, multiple tests. We did test this clinically. Uh, recently, uh, Corby Martin published the results of smart loss where that model was used in a smartphone application to guide patient weight loss during an intervention. And the results were very, very good. Um, the model did do what it was supposed to do, which I kept asking him. And people looked at graphs and it did something for them because I show graphs all the time in my classroom and it doesn't really do anything other than put people to sleep. But he said, yes, it, it worked really well. We use it in our clinic um, at Montclair State University and we've seen the same effect, although we're definitely not at the professional level of Corby Martin um, and his team. So... <clears throat> Let me give you a flavor of how we create those trajectories because they're not developed using statistical modeling. Uh, often uh, some of the models that I have um, are confused with statistical modeling, but this is a little bit different. So we begin with a 
law of physics, the first law of thermodynamics, which boils down in humans to what we know as the energy balance equation. We actually have a derivation that starts with the first law and then comes to the energy balance equation in a paper on starvation that I wrote with Bayesian Song. So what the energy balance equation st states, which I'm sure everyone here knows, is that the rate of energy stored or lost, which we denote as ES, is equal to the rate of energy intake minus the rate of energy expended. Now, um, I say rate in front of here. I'm always careful to put rate. Now you know I'm a mathematician because we have these little um, quirks, I guess, because this is measured in calories per day. And calories per day is a rate. It's a speed. And all of these measurements are speeds. We have a way of actually modeling speeds using something called differential equations. DFFM dt, for example, is what we call a derivative. It's a rate. So these are the kilograms per day of fat mass change. Um, and that has an energy density, which Dale Schuller helped me develop the um, energy density for fat-free ma fat mass, which is um, 1,200, uh, 1,020 calories per kilogram. Um, the 9,500 of uh, the energy density of fat mass is much more well-known, which was derived from chemical composition of tissues by Stephen Hinesfield and others. And you see that you have the cal uh, kilograms per day of loss or increase in fat-free mass and the kilograms of day in fat mass, um, and then you can convert those to energy densities. And that should give you the um, rate of energy stored or lost. <clears throat> so these things are called derivatives, and if you put them in equation with fat-free mass and fat mass on the right-hand side of the equation, that's called a differential equation. So it's not a statistical equation. And we learn all kinds of methods of how to solve those equations and what to, how to deal with those equations, just like an algebra student in high school learns about solving algebra equations. So I've talked about ES and how we would use derivatives to model ES. The next piece here is EE. In your department, you probably talk a lot about how energy expenditures are caught up. I, I like to say it looks a lot like the um, pie at the end of the tax forms, which um, tax booklet, which uh, is soon due, um, your taxes, where they look at where your taxes go. And this would be Social Security right here, resting metabolic rate. Um, resting metabolic rate is the minimum amount of calories required to sustain your life, or sometimes it's defined as the energy required to run your internal organs. Um, it's on average about two-thirds of the pie, more or less. And then we have these other components, which I just made up numbers so they total up to 100%, so they're just they're just fictitious. But uh, physical activity, that's the running, leaping, jumping, and stair climbing that you're doing. Spa is the spontaneous physical movements that you run throughout the day. Um, they could be fidgeting, and uh, it's talked about quite a bit in the literature um, by Jim Levine and others. And dietary-induced thermogenesis or thermic effect of feeding also represents the uh, expenditure that is um, associated with digesting food. So each of these terms have models that you can place in them. RMR, for example, we used the livingston kolstadt regression model because it had a scaling exponent um, as a function of body weight. Um, however, you could use mifflin saint Jor here. Um, Kevin Hall uses mifflin saint Jor. <coughs> Actually, Kevin Hall uses a different, um, different model that was developed that has body composition in it. Um, others have used mifflin saint Jor. You can use Harris-Benedict. Um, all of us use a similar term for dietary-induced thermogenesis or thermic effective feeding as a direct proportion of intake. And that proportionality constant I fit using data from Klaus Westerter. Physical activity, all of us use a very similar term as a direct proportion of body weight. So as your body weight goes down, the energy you expend in physical activity also will go proportionally down. And a spontaneous physical activity is the last piece, which is much more com complicated to model. Um, and I, I'm i actually going to skip that one. Just I want to give you an overview. Um, if you want to read more about how the spa term comes about, um, I'll uh, refer you to a, a, a paper. 
The most interesting thing in, in terms of exercise, though, is the Forbes curve. Forbes was a pediatrician who had a sense of um, data and calculus that I wish our students or bio students would be able to attain because it's the right way to think about calculus. I don't know if he ever had formal training in calculus, but it's, it's beautiful how he thought. Um, he has a beautiful book on body composition, human body composition, that I refer to quite a bit. Um, and what he hypothesized is that if someone has high baseline fat mass, when they're dieting or when they're changing their weight, they're going to lose selectively more fat. So they're moving horizontally in this direction. On the other hand, if they were lean, their selection will be more of the lean mass, fat-free mass. So you get a steeper looking section of the curve. He fit this curve using a log. I um, mean, you see this, um, there should be a 10.4 uh, in the front. Um, so he used a log to um, fit this concave down curve. And um, a couple of us used this Forbes curve inside our models. Now, the whole model's put together. I'm not going to show you a picture of that. I like to show that sometimes. But um, one of the t things that we've done over time is tested and tested and tested against uh, data where we knew the subjects were confined, so we knew exactly what how many calories were provided to them. Or we had multiple measures of doubly labeled water and body composition, so we can objectively determine energy intake. So what you see is a very good agreement between actual and um, model predicted mo uh, body mass in overfeeding and underfeeding studies. These are just a number of studies that I piled together for a, a presentation, but um, we've done this now for hundreds of subjects, and we get very similar results throughout, um, even with, interestingly enough, Claude Bouchard's overfeeding study, which is often, um, which is often discussed with me uh, when I first came on the scene. And um, of course, now I work with Claude, so I, um, he shared his data and I ran it through the models. Um, so another interesting size story. So why is exercise different? Um, first of all, the data is much less. And um, people who do exercise studies know what I'm going to tell you right now. But as a mathematician, you start to learn well, everything that comes in an Excel spreadsheet is not always, doesn't always have the same blood and sweat behind it. First of all, subjects in exercise interventions must perform exercise. You have to make them do something. Uh, unlike a dietary intervention where you tell them don't eat something, you actually have to force people to come in and do something. And that's really difficult to do. Um, if you start measuring things on top of them coming in and burning calories on the treadmill, you also have to measure resting metabolic rate, doubly labeled water body composition, they should be measured simultaneously for energy balance models, which is difficult. Exercise dose also needs to be increased. If you want to burn 300 calories a day, once their body weight goes down, they have to run longer to achieve that 300 calories per day. Um, the other part is that in free living individuals, you cannot control intake. Like I mentioned earlier, that's difficult to do. Um, unless the subjects are confined. And there was only one study where the subjects were conf confined and exercise and intake was controlled. Um, as Klaus Westerturk would say, there's a high dropout also from obese subjects, which you wouldn't get in a dietary intervention. And you might get that in di some dietary interventions. But um, obviously, there's something difficult about um, exercising as your body weight goes up, because you have to work a lot harder. I. Uh, with some uh, of my co-authors put together a review of questioning why, um, it was a curiosity on my part, why do individuals not lose weight, uh, that much weight from exercise intervention? And here at exercise, I mean aerobic exercise. Um, and in these studies, I looked for studies that were, uh, exercise was supervised, um, and at least body composition was measured so that I could start running en energy balance um, calculations. So what I did was um, I looked at the hypothesis through a different lens. I said, OK, let's suppose that someone increases energy expenditure through exercise. Then EE should theoretically go up. And this EI minus EE should be negative as long as EI stays the same and all the other components of EE stay relatively stable. Um, and so theoretically, someone should actually lose weight under an exercise intervention. But exercise intervention after exercise intervention shows that people lose modest amounts of weight or hardly anything at all. So why? Well, here's what I did. I took data from different studies 
And um, I don't have to have continuous derivatives here. I can have the change in fat-free mass over the change in time. This is what we call a difference quotient, change in fat mass over change in time, replace it, and that should give me the average change body energy stores. But that calculation actually gives me the actual achieved deficit of EI minus EE. And there was a total of 13 studies after we ran it through these criteria. And one of them was Claude Bouchard's confined study, the other one uh, in male twins, seven pairs of male twins. The second was uh, Bob Ross's study uh, in males and females, um, they were, I call semi-confined because they had to come and burn 700, up to 700 calories a day. And um, they were, they basically spent all day in the clinic and then would go home in the evening and then come back. Um, and he used other methods to me make sure that they were compliant. <coughs> Most uh, exercise studies are free living. And there's the strides studies in Duke University, and um, they were monitored using heart rate monitors. Um, Tim Church's studies, um, they come in and uh, Tim Church's team um, watches over them. That, this must be the Drew study I'm looking at here. And um, Joe Donnelly's study, that was a long-term study. So I selected some here to give you a sample of some of the studies that we looked at. So you can do this uh, average energy deficit for different studies and what you see is in the confined, semi-confined studies, you see almost a perfect match between the calculation of what they were supposed to lose if they jacked up by 500 calories a day versus how much they did lose. There's almost a perfect match. This is how much they increased physical EE by using physical activity and energy expenditures and this is what the actual deficit was when you did the calculation <coughs> with body composition or in other words, um, this is how much they increased physical activity by per day in calories per day, and this is how much energy per day came off their body on average. So there's a match. On the other hand, these are the free living studies, and that's where you see discrepancy. You see that the magnitude of achieved energy deficit is much lower than the magnitude that's been increased through energy um, physical activity. So there's a gap between the two. So the question is, why? Well, there's only three things that could explain that. One is that there was a decrease in resting metabolic rate. Um, there's some kind of metabolic adaptation. There could be a decrease in uh, spontaneous activity, or they could have increased energy intake. So those are the possibilities that explain this discrepancy. It's funny that um, most people think that RMR goes up, but what we really need to do is dissect apart the other variables because if energy intake also goes up, then body composition would change and um, resting metabolic rate is correlated to body composition. So I needed a study where um, individuals were confined and I knew how much they were eating and it was controlled. And so this is the Bouchard study um, that I'm showing you and you can see that um, this line here is the line that's regressed through baseline data, which is the uh, yellow, and the red is the 100-day resting metabolic rate. And you see that, especially on the lean edge, um, the 100-day um, data falls off the curve. So there is evidence of metabolic adaptation if intake is controlled at baseline levels. I, I don't want to comment on um, spontaneous activity because I think there might be some changes. I wouldn't know because the magnitude of increase or decrease um, might be within the zone of error from these calculations. But um, we know that there can't be outside the zone of error so far because the Bouchard and Ross trial should have shown that and they did not. So there might be some influence here, but it might be too small to detect. Finally, what about dietary compensation? Um, did they maybe eat more? Well, if I had one more calculation, body composition combined with doubly labeled water, I would be able to sum the two, the change body energy stores with um, doubly labeled water energy expenditures, and get an average energy intake. And this method has been validated um, at Pennington um, in some data. Uh, I can send you those papers. So um, they confined individuals and then tested it this way to see if this was an um, appropriate method. And um, Klaus Westerterp, in his study on marathon, half marathon um, runners who um, 
they were sedentary individuals trained for a half marathon, had collected doubly labeled water in addition to body composition in 13 of his subjects. And you see in 12 out of the 13, there is an estimated increase uh, in energy intake. So there is evidence that there is a compensation that's dietary. Now their self-report um, showed no change. So um, I think I'm at a 40 minute time limit, um, so I'm going to end it here, but, um, and I, I can post this later on the after effects of exercise, there's not much to it, but I, I would like to acknowledge that I have quite a few uh, collaborators, and this is not the full list, but I'm just giving you a subsample, and uh, I would like to acknowledge my funding that allows me to do this, these interesting, work on these interesting projects. Thank you.